part five of overcoming rejection. Often when someone experiences rejection or they buy into a worldview of rejection, they're unable to critique their own worldview. They don't see themselves as being controlled by these spiritual forces. So when they're punishing someone else, they really believe that their victims deserve what's happening to them. They need to believe that in order to validate their own emotions. Um, they really believe that the people that they're punishing are guilty and deserve to be treated that way. And that's very strongly emphasized in, in Islam, that when Muhammad killed those Jews, you'll find the, 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 the derivative stories about that always emphasize and play up how terrible the Jews were or how terrible the Christians were. And this becomes this need to actually justify this more and more. But you'll find that often people who experience rejection are unaware of their, how their own, um, the strongholds that are controlling their life are made up. And uh, they believe certain lies. For example, they actually believe that they're worthless, or they actually believe that other people have done terribly offensive things to them. And it's hard for them to see that their reaction is overblown or unreasonable. They believe that the control that they're exercising is rational. They have good reasons for it. They don't see it as something negative. Um, and so being able to see yourself is quite a challenge when you're caught up in this, in this stronghold. So Satan is the father of lies. And he, he, um, he, he not only does he bind us up, but he says, this is real, this is true. The way you're feeling is the, is the only interpretation of it. And part of the challenge is how to step out of that space, how to get a different perspective. And um, that's a nice segue into what we're going to talk about now, which is the impact of the example of Jesus. One of the most powerful things that can happen to someone who's caught in a worldview of rejection is to actually see Jesus and to encounter how he responded. Um, it's amazing that he would go and meet with tax collectors, with prostitutes, with rejected people. He had this capacity to actually get around those things and, and touch their hearts by his character and his life. And he, you can see his disciples struggling with rejection issues, wanting to fight, wanting to take offense, and he would constantly challenge them. So we're going to talk about how Jesus responded to rejection, because the greatest resource you have to stand against these things in Islam is to understand Jesus, and let him, his life transform your life, and to let his story become the story of people that are wanting to be free. Um, Jesus was rejected and many of his sufferings uh, were very similar to those of Muhammad. There was the stigma of illegitimacy. People said, you know, who is your father? Where are you from? He was accused of, of being illegitimate. He was born in a stable instead of a stable home. <laughs> That's a really rough way to start. Uh, Herod tried to kill him. I don't know how many of you have had people in your family or people in the community who went to great lengths to try and assassinate you while you were two years old or whatever, but that was Jesus' story. Uh, he became a refugee uh, in Egypt with his family. Religious leaders opposed him. And his authority was questioned. There were many charges that were raised uh, against him. He was uh, challenged about helping people on the Sabbath to show that he was breaking the law. Um, he was asked again and again what authority he had to do the miracles he was doing. He was challenged about the law. Is it lawful to divorce his wife? Is it lawful to pay taxes to Caesar? What's the greatest commandment? Whose son is the Messiah? He was challenged about his paternity. He was asked about the resurrection. He was challenged to perform signs and miracles. And uh, he was accused of being demonized, of having Satan, of doing miracles by Satan's power. Uh, he was accused of having uh, disciples who didn't follow the law. He was accused of giving invalid testimony. So there were many uh, charges that were made against him all the time. Uh, Muhammad also was questioned and challenged by his community too. Uh, so Jesus experienced many rejections during his ministry. At one time when he went back to Nazareth, his own village people tried to throw him off a cliff. I don't know if you've ever had that experience where you visit your family and they try and throw you off a cliff, but it sort of would have an effect on you, I think. You might feel a bit concerned about that. Um, the crowd tried to stone him, and he just escapes in both cases, just goes off into the crowd. His own followers deserted him, and this is the, very much the agony of the rejection of Christ becomes very acute in those last hours. Um, Judas is the one who betrays him. Jesus knew this was happening, and it would happen. 
uh, Peter, the one who loved Jesus so much and was so enthusiastic to speak up and to declare he was the Messiah, to be there, um, he, he disowned Jesus three times, said that he never knew him. Jesus prophesied that. He knew it was going to happen. The crowd that had welcomed him with palm branches and with praise and adulation was baying for his death. In fact, Pilate wanted to let him go, and it was the crowd that insisted that he be crucified. He was falsely charged by Roman and Jewish tribunals, both. He was tortured and mocked and abused, both in his trial and his death. Remember, one of the thieves that was crucified by him uh, scorned him and mocked him as he was dying. He was sentenced to death. He was cruelly tortured in a torture that killed many people and then he was crucified. So this is a, a kind of a litany of pain and suffering. We're so used to it. You know, we read these stories, we see the Pharisees didn't like him, and we read these incidents, but how would you cope with such an overwhelming burden of rejection in your life? What, how do you think you would respond to it? I think these disciples asked that question a lot as they later experienced rejection. It became a big issue because 11 out of his 12 apostles were killed according to the tradition. They were martyred uh, for following Jesus. He was innocent. Hebrews makes that clear. The scriptures make that clear. We do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet was without sin. And with respect to rejection, that means that Jesus did not, um, he didn't take the bait, didn't take the bait of Satan. He he didn't respond with violence, aggression. He didn't curse those who cursed him. He rejected those temptations to fight and to destroy. Um, also, his disciples were very conscious of following this example. It had a big impact on his followers. Christ suffered for you, Peter said, leaving you an example that you should follow in his steps, follow his suffering steps. He committed no sin, no deceit was found in his mouth. When they hurled their insults at him, he did not retaliate. When he suffered, he made no threats. Instead, he entrusted himself to him who judges justly. He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree so that we might die to sin and live for righteousness. By his wounds you have been healed. This is quite an amazing perspective that the pain of rejection and hurt that we suffer is healed because of the sufferings of Jesus, because of the rejection that he bore. And his innocence in not retaliating, in not declaring jihad against those that persecuted him, this actually spiritually validates his sacrifice and enables us to hand our own pains and uh, burdens and rejections uh, to him. And he bears the punishment for our sins and sets us free. We are saved, rescued, through this act of suffering that he went through. It's an incredible, incredible idea, really. Remarkable. And that we should follow, we should live like this too. This is, this is our life. This is how the Christian life is meant to be. I love this passage in Matthew 12. He will not, quoting Isaiah, he will not quarrel or cry out. No one will hear his voice in the streets. A bruised reed he will not break, and a smouldering wick he will not snuff out, till he leads justice to victory. How do you establish vindication in the world? How do you establish justice? Well, not by saying fitna is worse than killing. Not by killing those who persecute you. You do that with this incredible gentleness. A bruised reed he won't break, a smouldering wick he won't snuff out. That's an incredible image, really. The, the candle's been burning, it's just smoldering, about to go out, but Jesus doesn't put it out. He doesn't destroy the weak. He doesn't um, uh, use force. He doesn't shout. You don't hear his voice in the streets. He's not quarrelsome. He won't overwhelm people by, by shouting louder than they are, or by controlling them. And these are the methods he uses to bring vindication and justice to the world, victory to the world. comes through this incredible, incredibly gentle approach, incredible integrity, refusal to respond to rejection with violence, hatred, self-validation uh, and, and all those lies of Satan. So he maintains an incredible purity and innocence in the face of this overwhelming burden of rejection against him. 
He also taught that um, blessing is, persecution is a blessing. Blessed are you when men hate you, when they exclude you and insult you and reject your name as evil because of the Son of Man. Rejoice in that day and leap for joy. I'm being persecuted. Yay! <laughs> That's so exciting! I've been rejected by other people in the ministry. Lord, thank you, thank you. You know, um, they've taken my house away. Oh, praise God, I'm going to have a reward in heaven. Do we think like that in the West? Is that the way we live the Christian life? We so easily take offense. Oh, they did this to me. Why did they do this to me? And Jesus is really warning us about that way of responding carrying offense within us. He says, that's not the way I'm showing you. And I don't think his disciples could have survived if they'd, if they'd respond as we often do to rejection by taking offense and wanting to be justified, telling other people, do you know they said this about me? And, um, and so Peter says, even if you should suffer for what is right, you are blessed. His disciples got it. They understood that. It's a very deep lesson for us to learn. To be effective in evangelism to Muslims, you need to know this lesson because this is the lesson that is the opposite of what Islam is doing and claims over people. Your attitude should be the same as that of Christ Jesus, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but made himself nothing. He didn't say, I'm the best of the best. He adopted the position of being a servant, taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore God exalted him to the highest place. He was vindicated and gave him the name that's above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow. He was vindicated, but he didn't self-vindicate. He didn't destroy. He didn't respond with the rejection responses. The disciples understood it. To this very hour we go hungry and thirsty. We are in rags. We are brutally treated. We are homeless. When we are cursed, we bless. When we are persecuted, we endure it. When we are slandered, we answer kindly. That is Paul's testimony. He got it. He got it. He got it what it meant to be a Christian. Love your enemies is the most frequently quoted verse of the Bible in the evidence of the early church, in the sources from the early church. Based on the teachings of Jesus, two Western societies have supported a clear distinction between people, their identity, and the beliefs they hold. That you can, in fact, reject bad beliefs without attacking people. We've created a culture in which you're not supposed to be attacking or hating. It's a moral virtue not to hate. Well, Jesus' story is just really remarkable. His testimony is very deeply challenging for all of us. And uh, one of the uh, things I must say is that when I began to de delve deeply into the life of Muhammad, it was a painful experience. And I began to see, and I'll speak a little bit more about that, um, how uh, many of the attributes of Muhammad that were dysfunctional were being replicated on a grand scale throughout Islamic societies, such as, for example, the claim to be a victim, that we are the victims. And uh, this is very debilitating, and it weakens whole nations and civilizations. But the good thing is that I was thrown back to really study the example of Jesus more deeply. If you just take Jesus for granted, because you've read the stories in Sunday school and you just read them all the time, the incredible, amazing character of his life and character might be hidden from you. But when you make this comparison, you see Jesus is just incredible. He's so sweet. And more than that, he brings power for us, authority to stand against these principles and to bring people into freedom.